I am thrilled to be here, and I want to thank all of you for, for coming. Um, the first time I was at the Memorial Art Gallery was in 1978. Um, as, uh, as a wee one when I was helping my mom do the, the um, clothesline art show. I grew up, I graduated from Allendale, Columbia, and I grew up biking these streets um, all over. We lived in Webster, we lived in Rondecoit, and in the city, and I just, I just grew up biking everywhere. My mom's first studio was in the Fetter Building on East Main Street, right? And that's, that's that's right around the corner. We were just here all the time. So to, for me to come back here and to speak to all of you is a little bit on my bucket list. So when Maria wrote, uh, reached out to me, I said, oh yes, absolutely. I'm just absolutely thrilled uh, to be here talking with you all. So when we talk about city building, we, uh, with, with architects, urban designers, planners, we just get grounded in the technical. But I want us to pull back, because really what we're talking about is creating a community, creating a neighborhood, right? So what is it really that we're talking about? It's talking about walkable neighborhoods are healthy, they're sustainable, and they're prosperous, right? They're, uh, they're compact, they're pedestrian friendly, they put people first. And that's an issue that I'm going to keep coming back to about putting people first and not cars. Right? And great places prioritize people. I don't have my slides here, so I have to kind of go here. But most importantly, and I want to stress this, particularly as I look out here, that a great place, a great city, a great neighborhood has places, social gathering for people of all neighborhoods, of all socioeconomic demographics. And so often when we're talking about city building, so often when we're talking about how to revitalize a corridor or a neighborhood, we go with the low hanging fruit. We go where we can make it economically. But I want us all to, cha I want to challenge us all today and to think about how we can do it comprehensively and create the types of characteristics that I'm talking about throughout all of Rochester. I was on East Main Street yesterday visiting the old Fetter building. Again, I spent so much time on the street. So there's still some neighborhoods that, that could use a little bit of war. So when you build a city for cars, all you're going to get is cars. When's the last time your car, by the way, drove into some place and bought something? Cars do not produce economic development. People do, right? And when a city makes a conscious and intentional effort to put people first, magic happens. So Maria asked me to talk a little bit about the economic benefits of good placemaking, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna chat, chat a little bit about that. But uh, how many people here know walk score? All right, that's, that's, that's most of the hands. But walk score is just a very simple metric to figure out how walkable a particular place is. You know, is it, is it safe? Are there destinations? Uh, are, you know, what's the design feature? And so what research has shown, and all of this is heavily cited in my, in my notes, but um, what research has shown is that when you move from a 60 to an 80 in your walk score, your house goes up in value of approximately $100,000. All right, so if you are a state and a city that gets your income from property taxes, this is, this is money in the bank, right? We're also finding that uh, walkable urban office space commands a 74% premium. Again, if it's in a more walkable area. So we all have heard, or many of you probably have heard, that malls are being torn down and transformed into walkable, livable places. There's a lot of examples of that. But probably what you're less aware of is what's happening around um, office parks. So increasingly, GE, General Electric, just left Stanford, just left Stanford, Connecticut to move into Boston as a for example. Uh, John Deere just left the, the um, rural area of, I don't know the name, in Illinois to move into Chicago. If you want to create and attract businesses into your downtown, make your downtown a place where businesses want to go. 
right? Uh, Chris Leinberger from Georgetown University has done a whole series of these walk-up studies for different cities. He's done it for Boston, Chicago, a lot in the Washington area. And what they're finding, what he's finding is that you have an issue um, when you, on a per acre basis, a walkable urban environment increases the value of almost 12 times. Again, for those of you who are working in economic development, the old model of, and the Evan, Evan Dawson on WXXI asked me about this. He was like, oh, well, we want, you know, what about the businesses that want to move into the city, but they require parking? And if Evan is here, I, I apologize. And I said that they're going last city. Did I say something? Did I mess something up? All right. Um, that, that, that those businesses are last century, because increasingly, Businesses are moving into a city where you have that walkable urbanism. And you know why they want that walkable urbanism? They want it for their employees. They want it for their, uh, for, they want that creative class. They want the, the energy, the ideas, the cheap labor force of the millennials and the 30-somethings. Um, retail experiences in this walkable area can not only create social gathering areas, but also spend approximately 30% more, more funding, um, more money than when you're in a car. And a great example of this, oh, hold on. A great example of this is, yeah, you guys all know this, it's on Culver Avenue. I took this picture last night because again, I biked all the time when I was growing up here and I always stopped at, at uh, Delight Donuts, of course, why not, right? Every time I was there, even as a high schooler, and as soon as I learned how to drive, I took the expressway, and my car never stopped there to go buy a donut. So this idea, when you create places for people, your retail and your economic development is gonna go straight up. So why, why aren't we getting there? Why hasn't, why hasn't Rochester just completely, I'm coming over here to keep my eye on you because you keep laughing. <laughs> Excellent. Um, why, has, why hasn't not only Rochester but cities across the country really, really um, implemented this? If, it, if it's what people want and survey after survey demonstrates that anywhere between um, 50, about 40 to 50% of the population wants to live in a more urban, walkable area. The, the market is only responding with 5%, so there's a real gap. So if people want it, and it makes cities a lot of money, and it makes developers a lot of money, right? Why aren't we doing it? And that's, what, that's really what the focus of this talk is, is not only what can Rochester do to attract this type of development, but what can cities um, outside of Rochester do? And so the first is local codes. So this is such a mundane, boring issue, but it's the DNA of every single city. If you can fix your local codes, you're going to begin to really transform. So this is Columbia Pike in Arlington, Virginia, and it looked, it looked like this, which again, is this familiar to folks around here? Exactly, right, Columbia Pike. They, they passed a form-based code, and since the form-based code was passed, you've got almost uh, 1,500 new housing units, about a quarter of a million square feet of new retail, and uh, additional retail and uh, housing units are, are, uh, have been permitted. Just, I'm not gonna say overnight, because it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it goes back to what I was saying before. If you want investment to happen in a corridor, make it easy for it to happen there. Why is there so much suburban development all the time? Because it is easy to do. It is by right, you've got, it is easy as pie to go out, transform a, uh, transform a cornfield, knock down a forest, put in large lots with wide, wide streets, and your parking lot. Planning offices and permitting offices across the country are used to seeing that, and they just mark approval. So the trick now is to make it just as easy to have that approved um, in, in your walkable urban areas, right? So the biggest coding issues, as we talked about, is parking, right? We do not want to design our cities for cars. We want to design it for people. So when we are creating or having parking minimums, 
uh, that is going to raise the cost of parking. So I was talking to somebody today, I'm so sorry I forgot your name, Bill, I think. Bill introduced me, I'm so sorry, but somebody was saying, well, Rochester hasn't had a parking minimum since 1973 or 1976. Um, but it's the banks that are requiring, are requiring the parking. But really getting a handle on that parking, minimizing it, you've got stormwater, street design standards, there are a whole bunch of coding issues. And the problem with most cities is why they're not tackling it is that it is really hard and really expensive. How many people have heard of Code Next in Austin, Texas? Well, a few people, so let me tell you this. So Austin wants these outcomes. They're like, rock it. They had the political will. They had the money. Let's go ahead and do it. They have spent $8.7 million on a new citywide code called Code Next, and it's still not passed. And the new mayor just said, oh, we're stepping away from this. Seven years, $8.7 million. Coding is hard. It's the very DNA because nobody wants to give up what they already have. Wait, wait, you're talking about making the streets narrower, says the, fi says the fire chief. I have my really big trucks. Wait, wait, you're talking about taking away my parking? I don't, I don't want that. It's fear. So one of the, one of the issues that CNU uh, launched about four years ago is the Project for Transportation Reform. Let's not name a citywide effort. Let's never do code next again. You name it, you can touch it, you can start arguing about it. Let's instead meet local governments exactly where they are and think about small incremental changes that can happen. Instead of working for seven years and spending $8.7 million on a new citywide code, let's instead think about if you do nothing else, do this. For new development, put the parking in the back, right? Let's think creatively about what are the, what is, what is the few tweaks that you can do that will enable a great place. And once you begin to take away some of the barriers, you're really enabling the market forces to take over. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about, this is, uh, I use this example all the time, the Chevron dealership in Rochester and how it was redeveloped into 77 new residential units. But I want to talk to you a little bit about your own codes. I drove in um, last night on South Avenue, and I was so excited because I went from, I guess it was Henrietta, and then I could see, welcome to the city of Rochester, and your streetscapes changed dramatically. The, the, um, the buildings came right up to the street. You had a nice walkable area. I'm like, Rochester's got this. How exciting. And then, I was driving, as I said, I was visiting the old uh, Fetter building, driving down East Main Street, and yeah, there is a lot that needs to be revitalized in that street, but it has great bones, right? The houses, the houses are there, right up against the sidewalk, it needs a few more street trees, there's work that needs to be done, but the bones are there, it would not be hard to fix. And then I got to the intersection of East Main and Culver, opposite East High School, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the city, striking distance from the Central Business District, what did I find? Suburban development. Right at a key corner, I found suburban development. And what do I mean by that? I mean big boxes. I don't care that they're, I don't, I don't care that they're chain, not big boxes, chain stores with huge amounts of parking lot, right in the front. So here is a key intersection on a street that's got great bones, and now it's parking right on the corner. Suburban development. I don't know what the code said, but under no circumstances should you all be coding for suburban development within the city of Rochester. You've got, I mean, the beautiful thing about Rochester is that it's actually a fairly small region. I mean, comparatively to like Los Angeles, the DC area, you know, Boston. So if you're going to code, for the more suburban type of development, do it out in the suburbs, not in the city. Sorry, that's a rant. Uh, my bad. <laughs> Maria wanted me to talk about the economic benefits of placemaking. And there's a dark horse, and I'm surprised somebody hasn't already pointed out to me. It's like, Lynn, that's all great. That is fantastic, but does everybody experience those benefits? And, and the answer to that is no. Um, and that's a real problem that we need to address, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But one, one of the strategies 
that can enable places like East Main Street, that can enable the, part, the neighborhood around the public market to very slowly uh, transform is building more missile, mi missile, missile, <laughs> missing middle housing, right? And so missing middle housing is all of those housing types that are between a single family detached home and a multi-family home. They're everything in the middle. So there are uh, an aplex. I took this, uh, this is a beautiful aplex building picture I took in, in uh, Melbourne, right? It's a fourplex. It's a duplex, right? It's a, this is another duplex. I like, I like it because it looks just like a single family detached home. It's a cottage court. It's accessory dwelling unit, otherwise known as a granny flat. You see the apartment above the garage. All of these are different types of housing, uh, of missing middle housing. And the reason why it's so important is that you have, a, you have market rate housing at the top and then you have affordable or subsidized. Now, if I had uh, one of my board members here, he would say that all housing is subsidized because of the mortgage deduction, um, uh, mortgage deduction. but we're just gonna park that for a moment. Um, affordable housing is when you get, anyway, you all know what I mean. So you have, you have a gap then between market rate and affordable. And this is where a lot of us at one point in time have lived. How many folks at one point in time have lived in an apartment? Yeah, I think that's just about everybody. How many folks right now have somebody in your family that is living in an apartment? Yeah. So when we start talking about affordable housing, when we start talking about missing middle housing, it's not about other. It's about where we are at different points in our life. It's about where our family is at different points in our life. And this is why it is so important to start building it, because when we're able to build more missing middle housing, we, sh we shrink the gap, we reduce the housing gap. Missile, midi missile, I'm gonna get this wrong for the rest of the talk, I'm so sorry. Uh, missing middle housing, right, provides options. It is that small flat above the garage. It's where your, it's where your 22 year old can boomerang back. It's a smaller, less luxurious apartment. It is, that, it is that Victorian house that is transformed into three units where, you, where, the, where the person who did the work lives in one unit and rents out the other two. This is an economically sustainable model that cities across the country have used, um, used throughout time. And somehow, just post-World War II, we've gotten away from that. We're building primarily single-family detached homes or big multifamily. But what about the middle? So that's why I encourage, what can Rochester do to not only permit, but to enable more missing middle housing? And so the first thing that they can do is legalize accessory dwelling units. Does anyone here know if ADUs are legal and allowed and encouraged in Rochester? Yeah, that's number one on anybody's policy, uh, policy agenda. It's just legalize it. Not scary, not at all, right? The second is to think about secessional coding, right? So this was my apartment when I lived in Chicago. It's a three flat. This is a, a single family, actually detached home. But how can we begin to transform, think of all the New York brownstones, right? At one point in time, they were just one, one family was living there, but they can code into next. How can we build our McMansions in a way that could be transformed into three apartments at some point in time? Think about that successional coding. Think and plan for the future. The other, and again, going back to the city, is to eliminate the requirement or the exclusionary practice of single family detached uh, zoning. So even if you have a home right now, and I know that there are a lot of them in the city, get rid of that requirement. That in the city, you can build any type of housing that you want. I mean, you have to meet design standards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right, right. But it doesn't necessarily have to be single family detached. Single family detached homes within a city limits of Rochester does one thing at all. It excludes people. It makes it more expensive. And it makes it harder to live here. And so if Rochester really wants to start transforming itself Within the city, get rid of single family detached zoning. 
Just, just get rid of it. That's what Minneapolis just did. Don't you want to be just like Minneapolis? <laughs> All right. And then the other is to expand your notion of housing. Um, this is, uh, these are bento boxes, uh, which are essentially um, trailers that you can live in. But think about it. I have noticed a lot of surface parking lots um, in the city in just a short time that I've been here. And uh, trust me, you don't want the tagline, Rochester, it's a great place to park. <laughs> but the market isn't always available to build something else. So how can you transform into temporary housing? And by temporary, I mean anywhere from say one to four years. Where the school teachers, for example, have a temporary place to live, temporary again, one to, one to five years, until they can move into something more permanent. How can we begin to think creatively about the housing at a wide range of price points that, that are enable and attract a wide range of people back into our city? Because what we want to get all that economic development that we talked about earlier, you need people in the city, you need people on the streets, you need that vibrancy, you need that kind of, that quirkiness. And so putting bento boxes uh, th these trailers in a, in, a, in a parking lot as a temporary use. If you think this is crazy, it's already happening. It's already beginning to happen. So it's a great temporary use for those parking lots. So the one cautionary tale going back to, yes, yes, uh, eliminate single family detached um, uh, zoning. And I said, but you have to be careful of design. Design really matters. Design is the make or break on whether or not this is going to work. So this is a, a single family detached home and if it was built like this, everybody would be like, oh no! Can't you just hear the screams of the neighbors now? But if it was built like this, as a fourplex, folks would be okay. The only difference between this building and this building is the design. Design matters. And since we're sponsored by the Community Design Center, Sorry, that was a joke that just kind of fell flat. <laughs> uh, no, d design, design, is a, design is essential. There have been a number of CNU members um, and others who have done visual preference surveys, which essentially shows different levels of density and different level with just differences in design. So here's what 10 units, a, 10 units an acre looks like, and folks are like, oh, that would be really high. Or, you know, really ugly apartment buildings surrounded by parking. Design can really help create that vibrancy within the neighborhood. Anyway, third strategy is to support incremental development. Um, have any of you heard Majora Carter from the Bronx talk? Yeah, okay, a couple of folks and they're just like, oh yeah, she's just great. So Maj Majora, um, Majora was an environmental justice advocate in the Bronx, but she said something that, for me, was really profound, um, and for other people, too, who have heard her, which is, you want, in those neighborhoods that some people, um, I heard today, characterize as just throwaway neighborhoods. They're not throwaway neighborhoods. People live there. But in those neighborhoods, what can we do to encourage folks to stay and to invest? And that is Majora's whole, whole shtick, is working in her neighborhood where everyone said to her, you've got brains, you have talent, you need to get out of here. She's like, nope, I'm staying. And so this idea of incremental development, this idea of staying and partnering in your neighborhood um, and really grounding in the with the local residents, I believe is is, is one of the top priorities of the 21st century. CNU just last week released a new report called Building Local Strength, Emerging Strategies for Inclusive Development. With the fundamental question of if we want to revitalize places like East Main Street, if we want to revitalize areas that have seen decades of disinvestment, how can we do it in a way that minimizes displacement and increases access for opportunity for all? The report came out and uh, I spent a lot of time with writing what I call CYA language because that's a bold statement that I just said and this report doesn't begin 
to answer it completely. It can't, but what we hope to do is that it starts the conversation, right? And so much of that work has really been inspired by Majora. Uh, by Majora. I encourage you all to go to our website, um, cnu.org, um, and download the report. But anyway, going on, and so much of what's in there is around incremental development. Um, I wanna tell you the story of Portland. And no, I don't mean Portland, Oregon. I mean Portland, the Portland neighborhood in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so it had great stories, a great history, um, great buildings, great bones. You probably have heard all of that. But a lot of the homes kind of looked like this. They weren't even, you wouldn't, didn't really need to worry about displacement because folks had already left. And so the price of these homes was about $10,000 to buy. And a CNU member, Gil Holland, started buying them and then investing um, about $70,000 in rehab, right, to essentially take an abandoned home. I'm sure you can imagine what these abandoned, dilapidated homes in this neighborhood um, were doing, right, to, I, I don't mean about the property values, just put that aside. I'm talking about like the soul of the neighborhood and how people felt not only about their neighborhood, but how they felt about themselves. So he went through and did it incrementally, house by house, um, and, uh, and then re rehabbed it. And please, for anyone who says, Lynn, you're from CNU, and this is an incredibly ugly house, yes, and look at what he's done. He was able to place um, people in who were previously in um, substandard housing in these homes, right, at a rent lower than what the affordable housing um, rate was in Louisville. So right now there are 30,000 people on the wait list in Louisville to move into um, Section 8 housing and the rent for that is $730. He was able to move people into this home for $630. And I'll tell you something else, after they, moved, after they lived in that home for a year and paid their rent on time, he would then walk with them to the bank and get a mortgage to buy the home. That's what we're talking about, that's building local strength. It's not displacement. That's exactly how we can incrementally begin to revitalize some of these areas. The total number of properties he's done to date is 50. This is over three years. So yeah, this isn't like a huge Hope 6 project where almost uh, you know, 3,000 units were built. I think it's more than that. I think it's 1.2 million, right? But it's a start. If Gill can do it, can it happen in another area? Can it happen in Rochester? So um, a good friend of mine and CNU member, R. John Anderson, uh, formed the Incremental Development Alliance, which is, essentially, which is essentially a program to identify people in the neighborhood and to give them the skills to develop. So we're not talking about attracting developers to a particular area. We're talking about building the developers, providing them the skills so they can build and rehab their own neighborhood. So in, the, in three years, he's done approximately 45 workshops. He's done seven, and of those workshops, 17 projects have been done for a total of 70 units. I mean, in just three years. And now these numbers don't seem very big to you, but I'll tell you, a number of corollary organizations, purpose-built uh, purpose communities, which I'm a huge fan of, has been working for 10 years, and they've created 3,000 mixed-use developments, or mixed income. That's over 10 years, and just in three years, John's got 17 projects done. It's a start, right? And so, uh, before, this is in Fayetteville, Arkansas, after. Because that's the trick here, right? When we're talking about neighborhoods that are winners and losers, the idea is not to identify, not to, to, to um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not identify. Oh, I hate being 50. No, 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 no. Um, name, market, uh, label. We don't wanna label these neighborhoods as a loser neighborhood. Who would do that? It, would you have children? You have classmates? Do you have friends? Would you ever label any of them, um, if you hadn't been drinking too much, um, as like a, you know, that's, that's gonna be a loser neighborhood? No. So the strategy for revitalizing some of our neighborhoods that are most challenging 
is to really identify the local talent, support, and build that capacity. Not to bring somebody in, but to work collaboratively. To work as a true partnership. Anyway, so that's incremental. Oh, so this is John. Um, and amplifying, he talks a lot about codes because so much, of, so much of what he does can't be done because of codes. He does this great workshop with um, local government officials and, it, and he's like, all right, here's a lot, here are the codes. I need you to, to figure out how you can build a fourplex and meet your parking. And, and you just you can't do it on some of these lots. And then the next week, the local government changes the, the parking requirements. It's really, it's really quite, quite remarkable how he does it. But it really is about creating, creating jobs. Okay, I'll, I'll move off of that land, rent and uh, move into leveraging infrastructure um, investments, which is, which is a, a, a remarkable piece. So when you think about infrastructure, everyone starts thinking about uh, rail, transit, fixed rail transit, but it's more than that. It can be, you know, not only the roads, but also your sewer, your green infrastructure, your parks, et cetera, et cetera. So you all are in a really fortunate position right now to have um, a significant amount of, of infrastructure investments coming your way, right? And so the key piece, the why you want to leverage your infrastructure investments, particularly if you're in a cooler market, is that it can kickstart a whole bunch of development. You have the governor um, investing now $50 million in Rock the Riverway. Whatever you want to think about it, that is $50 million that are helping to revitalize a key natural asset. You, you have an enormous success in filling in part of the inner loop. I learned how to drive on the inner loop primarily because nobody was there. <laughs> it's true. So, so how these are incredible investments that are coming to your city. And my question to you all are, what are you doing to leverage that? A great example of this is I was in Topeka, Kansas, um, looking at green infrastructure. I'm a water geek. One thing that, that uh, Bill didn't mention is that I'm a water geek. And uh, looking at the, the intersection between stormwater and the built environment. And they really wanted to do a green infrastructure demonstration project. And they wanted, took me to this site that was um, approximately three miles from the downtown area. And then we went to dinner in the downtown area and their main street, which was half boarded up. And I said, why don't we do the green infrastructure here on the main street? They're like, no, 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 no. We really think this other place is, is good. But this idea of leveraging your infrastructure investments. This is money that is coming that you're already spending. How can you spend it in a way that will meet multiple outcomes? I, I have to say, I think as a country, and whether that's at federal, state, or local, we're at a period of time where we can no longer afford to spend any money on infrastructure that meets one objective. We can no longer afford to build a road that's only going to move cars from point A to point B. We are absolutely in a period of time where we have to make infrastructure investments that will meet multiple community goals. That where you build, a, you build a road that not only will increase mobility of cars, transit, bikers, and walkers, but also, has to ha but also can deliver a wide number of place-making outcomes. You build housing not just to house people, but that develops a vibrancy in your downtown. So that's exactly what Lancaster, California did. Lancaster is located about 80 miles northeast of Los Angeles on the other side of the, uh, of the mountains. And this is what their main street looked like. I don't think it will surprise anybody that the cars driving down here were going somewhere between um, 55 and 60 miles an hour. And the stores loved it because nobody stopped. You notice many of them are boarded up. They got a grant and invested $11 million in streetscape improvements. They didn't have money to do planning. Uh, those of you who had breakfast with me this morning learned that I'm the anti-planner. They didn't have money to do any of the planning. They just tamed their street. And what happened is that it became a community destination and ultimately attracted over $300 million in private investment. That's how we're using infrastructure dollars to meet multiple community outcomes. And it's happening not just um, in Lancaster, it's, helping, it's happening all over. This is the 
Uh, I like bike-oriented development, I'm a cyclist, right? So this is happening in, in St. Paul of new development that is occurring adjacent the new bike lane that they put in. Um, it's 5.5 miles, has attracted almost a half a billion dollars in, in development. I have stories like this all over in every single town. And you all have this gift. The, the, the interloop is being filled in. You're getting this big grant from the federal government. What are you doing? How can you advocate? You all need to be out talking to, talking to the city officials, talking to the mayor to say, what are we going to do to maximize these investments that are coming our way? Um, finally, we need, to, we need to be creatively engaging with the public. Um, how many of you have shown up at a public meeting somewhere between 7 and 9 p.m. and you've got your three minutes to talk about what's going on? And did that work? Did you feel listened to? Did you feel empowered? No, nobody does. That's awful. They should be banned. Those types of public engagement, public comment, comment. and I'm sorry I, I, uh, if I overstep here, but if there's any um, city officials in the room and you guys are still doing this, that is just so like civil war, not even last century, but way back. Kill it, kill it now. Kill that public meeting right now. That is not public engagement. That is you checking a box that in some code you've got to do that. Just kill it. And begin to think creatively about how you can meet your residents, your neighbors, your friends where they are. So you've got the public market. What do you think of this? What, what should we be next? You've got an empty parking lot. Put up a sign. What should I become? My son tells this really funny story. Um, uh, he's 16. He's in high school. And he's become really engaged in the opium epidemic. And no, he doesn't do drugs or anything. But he's like, why is this happening? So he started um, going to um, or following this online with the uh, Arlington County government. I, I don't know why he does some of these things. Anyway, the, and he reached out, can I have the notes, what happened at this meeting? Because he's got email and whatnot, and they're like, oh my gosh, we would love to talk to you. Can we just, we'd really love to get your perspective. How's two o'clock on Tuesday? <laughs> and he's like, well, that's great, but I'm in English. <laughs> if they really wanted to find out, why didn't you go to school and sit down at his lunch table and talk to him and his friends? He was like, that would be great. No parents around, no teachers around. We would have given them all sorts of information. Meet people where they are. And so this is a, you know, CNU, the Congress for the New Urbanism, New Urbanism, Smart Growth, a community design center. It's all about the charrette, about doing the, the design structures. Um, but I can tell you, having, having participated in a number of these, the power of having the public works official picking up a pencil and with a piece of trace paper over a parking lot and having him with his pencil draw a line that connects two streets. And I say, yes, that is what connectivity is. It's like, wow, so that's how you do it. I'm like, yeah, that's how you do it. And that's really powerful. You begin not to have these facilitated conversations that are overly managed, but you meet people where they are, you give them a pen, you get them talking and engaging and interacting. I overheard Maria say something, I'm gonna quote you, you didn't realize I was listening. Um, I overheard Maria say something I thought was, and I'm gonna quote you now for a long time on this. She was talking to somebody, and I don't know the context, and they're like, well, our environment is man-made. And she said, yes, yes it is, it is man-made. But what happens if it was woman-made? What happens if it was minority made? What happens if it was child made? I probably messed up that quote. But I think that's a really important issue. And so one aspect um, of trying to meet people where they are is tactical urbanism, which I'm sure you've seen it. But what's really powerful about tactical urbanism is it gets people out of their houses. It gets them stopping by and engaging directly with their community. So, Envision it, plan it, build it, experience it. And if it works, great. We did a project, um, is that the next slide? It's not, okay. We did a project in uh, Chatham, which is in the south side of Chicago, uh, tactical urbanism, and it was supposed to be for two days. 
And uh, you know, south side of Chicago, as I'm sure you can imagine, is a, is a little sketchy and not a lot of investment happens there. And so we did this big tactical urbanism and created a series of outdoor gathering spots. And, the, and, the, and community members came out from everywhere and they're like, this is fantastic, can we keep this? And the alderman was there and like, yeah, I, I think we can keep this. Well, we had a terrible time getting that permit just for the two days and the alderman's like, Let's keep this up. Let's keep this up for the rest of the summer. And then it got built again the next summer. And this summer now, it's becoming permanent. So there's a couple of takeaways uh, that I want to, ooh, didn't go. There are a couple of takeaways that I want to leave you with. Um, the first off is that walk walkable places are popular and then they can create lasting value in, in, in your city. This is a terrible, I wish I missed my whatchamacallit. But and that, that's an easy one. But the other piece is that momentum exists in your community. It exists in every single neighborhood. It exists right now in each person here. So I challenge you, what can you do when you leave here? What can you do tomorrow that can keep building on this momentum? And maybe it's, maybe it's something really small, or maybe it's something big, like getting the city to eliminate single-family detached zoning. But, you know, what can, what can you do? That momentum exists, find a barrier and to begin to remove it. Support incremental development. That, that's gonna be a game changer across the board. Um, empowering the neighbors, empowering the legacy residents, giving them the tools, the capital, to create wealth, to build their own legacy in their, in their, in their neighborhoods. And then finally, oh, demand drives, uh, demand drives demand. We, well, we've talked about this. But the biggest takeaway that I wanna leave you with is that if you build places for people, they'll come. So let's work on getting rid of the cars. Let's work on the power of building a new street, a new neighborhood, and a new city. Thank you very much. My staff would kill me if I didn't tell you and do a little pitch for CNU 27 in Louisville, which is in about three weeks, so I know you can, you can all change it. But, um, uh, we're also going to be in the Twin Cities next year. Um, trust me, it is a, it is a game-changing experience. Um, if you've never gone before, uh, apply for a scholarship. Um, for the last uh, five years, oh yes, that would be my entire tenure, we haven't rejected um, a scholarship application. Yeah, because you know why? We need this information. We need to be revitalizing our cities. And then if you need to get a hold of me, there's my information. So, yes, Maria. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Is Can you guys hear me okay? This is working. Okay, great. Yes. Well, Lynn, thank you so much. And I, I appreciate you crediting me with that quote. It got me thinking because uh, our speaker, our luncheon speaker last May was an urban anthropologist, a young woman, who started this whole idea of we live in an artificial environment that's been designed by a certain person. And who is that certain person that is responsible for building that environment? And typically it's older, older white men. So we all have different experiences. We approach things from different perspectives. And this is why it's so important to have more people at the table, all people at the table. Thank you so much for fleshing that quote out. When I heard you say it this morning, I yep. was like, oh, that's exactly right. So I just stole it. So thank you for this that. Great, great. So. Um, if someone has a question, you're welcome to come up and speak into the microphone. Otherwise, um, I, I think I have a question or two for you. First of all, there are three of us uh, from CNU that are, I'm sorry, from Congress of New. We have too many acronyms. Well, yeah, but everyone There are three knows. of us from CDC, which is oh. the <laughs> center. <laughs> Community Design Center that are going to the Congress of New Urbanism in Louisville, so and that'll be fun. And you got a scholarship, didn't and you? And I was one of the recipients of the scholarship, so I'm very excited. So we're looking forward to that. Um, we are very fortunate to have so many uh, wonderful things happening in Rochester. It really is changed the way that we view our city. I, I see a lot of excitement. I, saw, I see a lot of people talking more about the different things that might be happening. 
Uh, and I've always, in the time that I've been here as the executive director, one of the very first understandings that I got was we do have to deal with the car. Uh, it's the first thing that we have to deal with if we're interested in placemaking. And in the definition of placemaking is a people-oriented uh, design approach. And so we have to, we don't have to eliminate the car everywhere, but we have to eliminate the car where we want people to be. Or so, better manage it. Or better manage it. So being mindful of where we have people places and where we have car places. But it can be done. So does anybody have a question that they want to bring up to the, the podium? So uh, while folks are thinking about the question, so we were um, in the area by the inner loop, and we were in, you know the name of the development that, that Charlotte Square. Thank you, which had its whole first floor for cars, right? Which kind of broke up. I mean, there's a lot of good things about that, but it, the whole first floor was cars, yet there was a parking garage that was a uh, half a block away. So we are not talking about eliminating the car, but that's what we mean by better management. In so many cities now, they're creating parking districts. Google now is developing a 20,000 person neighborhood in San Jose where the parking garages are gonna be on the, on the outside and you won't be able to drive in. There'll be other ways to get in groceries and whatnot and for accessibility. But there are ways, there's really creative ways to better manage the cars um, and Rochester's not doing that well just yet. Not yet, but you know what? We have a lot of great things. Number one, we are generally flat. Our center city is rather uh, contained. So I think I've heard say it's probably about at most a 20 minute walk from edge to edge of the inner loop. And so by building a really compelling, I love the word compelling, a compelling pedestrian experience, mm -hmm. we can really bring some uh, vitality to our, our urban space. And the fact that anywhere you stand downtown, you are within sight of a parking garage. Literally, check that out sometime when you're downtown. Um, there have been parking studies done and there's a lot of uh, information that's being put towards figuring out how we manage this situation. But a lot of it is up to us as consumers. Mm -hmm. If we demand that there be a parking spot in front of the store that we're gonna go pick up our dry cleaning, then that's what the business owner is gonna ask for and that's what they're gonna get. So the more we have the car impede in our urban spaces, the less friendly it's gonna to be to uh, pedestrians and other users. So we with have that, we have some questions. Hi, I live near that intersection on Culver Road in East Main that you talked about, where they built the store. The problem was that there was a gas station there and it would have required extensive remediation and that's why they pushed the building back. But one side of the building does sit near East Main Street. Do you have any solutions about how do you get it? Oh, I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it. How do, you, how do you get around that problem? Okay, let, let me repeat the question. Um, what Juanita said was the reason there is a, a store with a large parking lot on the corners because that was formerly a gas station. And so uh, I, I've been meaning to working with my staff to come up with some urban do's and don'ts of placemaking. And the first thing that I can think of is don't lose your corners because as soon as you lose your corners to these uses that, uh, that um, allow that kind of development to, to creep down the street, it's, you'll never get it back and that's a perfect example. Do you have any answer to that? Yeah, I, I think that perhaps um, you all were given wrong information. And I say this as a former 15-year employee of the Environmental Protection Agency. So to remediate it, the building would have done it. You, you just needed an impervious surface. You could not allow the water to percolate through. So a park would have been a bad use. But to put a building there that would have had a concrete floor, that's the remediation that you need. Um, for it. So the fact that they're like, no, we can't put a building there, we can only put a parking lot. Um, look at Atlantic Station in Atlanta, Georgia, which was a 137 acre, not gas station, but steel mill. There was a lot of contamination there, and I think at last count there was 4,000 housing units on it. So I Thank think you, that's Maria. the piece that, that, that you, and that's a, that's a common problem. Um, how to say this diplomatically, that um, sometimes state 
state agencies or staff at state agencies aren't always as forthcoming with information. We see this a lot with state DOTs. We see this a lot with, um, with public works, uh, public works um, officials as well. So there was no reason for remediation reasons um, not to put a building on the corner. Hi. Um, so I really love a lot of those ideas. I don't know if you know, um, but Rochester just released its draft comprehensive plan. And All so, 500 pages. Yes, yeah. big, I, I've read it, it's good. Um, but, uh, uh, and so hopefully we'll be able to start uh, revising our code in light of that sometime soon. And I hope a lot of these ideas are incorporated. But um, what I'm interested in is how do you um, connect uh, your, your assertion that the public needs to be engaged in the process of uh, redesigning the, the spaces that they live in with the idea that maybe code should be revised quietly. Um, I feel like uh, it's, it's easy to see how uh, the idea of code revisions could uh, scare some of the public, and, um, but I just want to know how, how do, do you think about that relationship between um, the risk of uh, showing the public a, a big uh, citywide code uh, revision and the sort of reactions you can get from that versus the risk of not showing them the changes that you're making? Um, so that's a really good question and oddly in the, in the two years that we've been talking about the project for code reform, nobody has asked that. Um, because I think, let, let me clarify, when we're talking about suggested code changes, um, they are very simple text edits of changing one word. Um, so not doing something as, as uh, not doing something as bold as saying legalizing ADUs, um, you know, straight out that you can go build something in your backyard, but rather if you have a garage and you want to convert it, that's legal. So small text edits versus something that would dramatically change the flavor of of the organization of the of the neighborhood. So that's that's that piece there. Um, and as I said, we've worked now in um, three different states on this, and um, nobody's asked that question. So, um, I, I, and I'm not, I'm not a coder at, at all. Um, so I think that's, that's the real distinction between saying for new development, you put the parking in the back um, and not, not in the front. Again, small text edits of parking must be in the front. Text edit to parking must be in the back. Uh, <clears throat> I just had a question you talked about in the beginning, leaving suburbia to suburbia, um, but I think one of the biggest challenges that Rochester has is that we're at the mercy of suburbia quite a lot. Um, we have a lot of individuals working downtown that expect a suburban environment, that expect a place to park, um, and I just wonder if you have some thoughts on how you demonstrate the value of maintaining the urban environment in the city itself without being at the expense of and the pressures of the suburban influence and, and values? Just say no. <laughs> okay, I, that, that, that was a little flippant, but let me expand upon it that the um, folks who are providing the pressures on suburbia are not voters. And you know, the reason why there are people living downtown is that they wanted the convenience and the vibrancy of living downtown. Um, and I understand that, um, that there may be e economic reasons, but I say this a lot to small rural towns that are trying to transform. It's really important to say no. It's really important to hold the line that yes, you may want any type of development, but let me tell you that mini self storage on your prime corner is not going to give you the outcome that you want. I, 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 worked, for, I worked for the federal government for 15 years and now I'm in an advocacy position, but I'll tell you that the choice is yours. You all can determine if you want your city to be a place primarily for cars, or if you want a city that is more vibrant, that has better economic outcomes. Because the, the, the research is clear. You build it more for cars, you know exactly what the economic outcomes are going to be, and it'll just be a matter of time before you'll file for bankruptcy. But if you choose a different path, we know how to get there as well. 
And then the other piece, you know, I talked that about 50% of the people want to live in a walkable urban place, but that means about 50% of the people that don't. And I think that's really important that we stay grounded in choice. You want to live in your single family detached homes, there's a lot of places in Pittsburgh, Webster, Arondequoit, Penfield, which is where my stepfather uh, had his house, et cetera, um, that, that where you can do it. But you do that within the city limits and you're going to get some not so attractive outcomes. So that's why I'm dead serious about just say no. If they want their suburban environment, move to the city and vote. So um, one of the, th A, I like your idea of covert coding, but B, that reliance- But the other guy didn't, he raised a really good point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, I, I'm not thinking it's not, good too, but um, the whole push obviously towards single family housing is not by chance from World War II. It has a lot to do with the housing movement, the laws that passed on, and what we actually really know as redlining, right? Um, so, so much of it is tied to that. It strikes me very much that the coding within the city still has, and in many cities does, systemic racism living in the heart and core of why it works the way it works. Yep. Um, to undo that, it strikes me as we have two major choices and, and a third one of minor coding changes, but um, which is to either make it really blatantly clear that it is systemic racism, what it is that the coding is doing and why we should change it, or I think to create a vision of the walkable city that we want and that's possible for everyone that is inclusive. Um, but I think both require this very active campaign. Do you have any thoughts or suggestions um, about either which one is a better reliance or even if we use both, how we can best achieve those aims in doing so? Because I think without really naming the beast or naming the world we want, we're not gonna get there. Yeah, I, I, uh, I like both of your choices and I don't think it's a choice. I think you need to do both. Richard Rothstein just published a book called The Color, Color of Law where he outlines the wide range of, I haven't read it yet, it's on my book stand, uh, 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 outlines the wide range of practices that are in cities that have fostered, promoted, and encouraged systemic racism and exclusion, exclusionary practices. And we're at this point now, um, at not only in, in Rochester, but across the country, that there's greater awareness of what we did in the past and what the outcomes were and what our, um, what our unarticulated privileges. And so in the same way, we were talking earlier about the lack of women in, in our field, and I said there's a responsibility on the, on the point of um, CNU members who are men to say, you know, just say no to all male panels, um, as a for example. And I think that there's a responsibility of all of us in the room here, too, to say, no, we need to have a more inclusive city. Um, and how do we do that? And so I don't think it's anything that's easy. I don't think it's anything that we can change overnight. I don't think it's a simple campaign, um, communications campaign. I think it's a lot of hard work. I think it is hard work that needs to be done by everybody in this room on a regular basis. Um, you're sitting in a meeting and uh, you're talking about that 500 page plan, getting public comments, and I want that young planner sitting at that meeting to raise his or her hand to say, well, who's gonna go into XYZ neighborhood and talk about that? In Minneapolis, they have, um, they take a, um, like a rickshaw and it's the public, it's the planning department on wheels and it's the rickshaw that has the plans and everything and they go walking down the street in the neighborhoods where it's unlikely that residents will open up a 500 page plan and they'll start talking it through. So that's, that's what I think. It's really hard work, which is why I think it's one of the major challenges, the top five challenges of this century, because we need to start talking about it as a problem. We need to acknowledge it, that it's a problem, and then to say, okay, what are we going to fix it? And it's not gonna happen overnight, because how we got there didn't happen overnight. Anyway, good question. Can I borrow your mic? So, so one of the things that I, I say when we talk about this issue is, you know, the, these things happen very intentionally. There, there's no, there's no, uh, we, we, we know that this was all very intentional. So we have to be just as intentional and 
choosing that different outcome. We have to take the extra step to get all the different people to the table, to seek uh, the other's opinion. And it's absolutely critical for our community. Um, it's harder. Collaboration. It's, it's harder. When we're all the same, it's easy to come to agreement. We all have a similar experience. We all have similar resources. And so we all agree. But when you bring different people with different perspectives, it makes things a little bit more difficult. But it's absolutely worth doing, and it's absolutely necessary. So with that, we have come to 1.30. And if you have one more question, you will take it. Otherwise, well, we will do it privately. Can we, can we do two questions, or are you guys ready to go? We're oh, we're good. Well, what the? All right, Renee, you're up. Um, hi. Two of the biggest challenges to walkability are, um, particularly in neighborhoods that have these good bones that you were talking about that were around before advent of, uh, or before the car was king, um, are dealing with the DOT and ah, ah. Um, also um, fire code. And you <laughs> mentioned the size of the fire trucks, but I mean just um, that there's. Can you t can you talk about how how we work how through we that? that? Yeah, so um, the uh, International Code Council, which is the Bible for your emergency responders, um, uh, recently uh, changed their code, I think it was in 2016, um, to say that we can have narrow streets um, for public safety reasons. So when your fire chief says, I need to have a wide road for public safety, you need to A, pull out that code and says, right here we can have for public safety, you need to first pull that out so he knows that it's legal. And then the second thing you need to do is to talk about and find all the statistics of the car accidents in Rochester that occurred because of high speed. You begin to slow down the cars, you're going to save lives. 90% of the fire chiefs, 90% of the emergency responders in Montgomery County are about car accidents. They are not about fire. So the fire trucks get deployed mostly for car accidents. Do you know what the number one killer of children is in the United States? Number one killer. Cars. You've got it right in your garage probably. It killed me. I had, I had my baby, brand new baby, and it was around Christmas time. And my pediatrician says, oh, you can't go out to Starbucks. You can't go out and people, not until the baby's six weeks old. And I'm a new mom. They're like, well, I can't be inside for six weeks. I need to be outside. We'll just get in the car and drive around the Beltway. <laughs> because it's safer to drive around the Washington, D.C. Beltway than it is to walk my brand new baby up to Starbucks and to get some much-needed caffeine. So that's, and then state DOT, so, oh, well, um, so friend, meet Larry Gold, um, CNU national board member, um, he can tell you about that. It is a real bear working with state DOTs. And uh, this is gonna sound incredibly morbid, but um, at some point in time, the folks who are the real barriers will die off. <laughs> No, there's been a lot of work that we've done. You've got the Institute for Transportation Engineers with context-sensitive streets. You've got the, the federal DOT talking about the importance of every place counts and highway removal. Um, there's a lot of incredible information and research done by the wide range of stakeholders, and still some DOT engineers persist. And so going back to what we were talking about earlier, it's about acknowledging their fear of that and sitting in that space and then just pounding them with the, with the, with the right research and the, the materials. We've, we've had a lot of success and I think once you get a little bit success, I mean look at, do you know the number, the leading state in the United States for highway transformation is New York State. You've got Sheridan Expressway, I-81 is coming down, the inner loop filled in, um, some road that I can't pronounce in, in, uh, in Buffalo um, just was recently closed and now the, they're talking about it's the Sagadaga. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and now you have the Skyway coming down. Once you're able to do it in one place, um, it, it has a trickle effect. Fine presentation. And I'm interested in your opinion on a particular tool of densification where if you've got an area of parking lots intermixed with buildings that it's a trade-off so that you can completely uh, develop uh, the area with parking lots, having a parking garage adjacent so that all the cars are concentrated there and that you no longer have that parking lots. Parking district. Building. 
Is that what you mean? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure I quite understand your question. So instead of scattering surface parking lots kind of throughout, um, rather to concentrate it, and yeah, that's called a parking district. Uh, Bethesda, Maryland has used that really effectively. So as a developer, you pay into the parking district fee. So depending on your real estate values to build um, a structured parking lot will cost you anywhere from 20 to $30,000 per space. Um, surface parking lots uh, are a little bit less engineering, but they're still gonna cost you somewhere between three and $7,000 per space. So if you're a developer and you want to build XYZ and you have a parking requirement of X, right, what is that fee that you would otherwise be spending to build with parking and that goes into the parking district. That enables the municipality to better balance the supply of parking and demand. I have a car, I like to drive my car, I drove up here because I'm gonna be all over upstate New York over the next couple of days, but I bike to work every day or I take the train. Because I think the bottom line of what we're all seeking is transportation fluency. There's, I'd be batshit crazy to drive to work in DC because you'd be in traffic all the time. Biking in the train is so much faster. There's a really good reason for congestion. We're never gonna get to a point where we can just, where, where there'll be no congestion. If that's the case, we'll have no economic development. Sure, and I was thinking of uh, parking lots pre-existing. Not that a developer would build parking lots, mm -hmm. but rather that he would build buildings where parking lots are. Right, how that's... How do you incentivize that? Oh, how do you incentivize that? Yeah, that's called gray field development. How do gray you incentivize field. it? Change your codes, right? Make it really easy to do that. Right, uh, work with your economic development department to identify, because there's parking lots everywhere. How do you begin to choose from your 400 parking lots that are in, the, in, in Rochester, right? So you start looking at, this goes to leveraging your infrastructure investments. Look at those that are near or adjacent and an, an, an existing or future planned, um, but the money's already there. You know, not planned like far out, but uh, soon. Um, investments. Look to identify your priority parking lots that you want to see transformed and then figure out how to incent it. Is it streamlined permitting? Is it a reduction in stormwater requirements? And, and until you, and I can tell you all, all the reasons why that would, that's a, a, that totally plays out. You've got, ex, you've got um, a certain amount of stormwater coming off of a forest, you're gonna knock it down and put something in, that stormwater is gonna go right up. You remove entirely the stormwater requirement for that parking lot, you have not increased runoff at all. This, by the way, has been blessed by the US EPA and by the state of New York. You wanna redevelop that parking lot, remove all your stormwater requirements. Thank you. All right, we have one, one more um, question here. Yeah. Yeah, um, my name is Mary and I really enjoyed your presentation. My question is around um, this uh, embattled parcel in the middle of our city. It's called Parcel 5. Um, it used to be the site of our mall, and they tore it down. And it's the last remaining parcel, and it's very centrally located. Um, we've gone back and forth over the last couple of years of what to do with that. Um, there's been an organic grassroots movement to um, make it a, a, a gathering space, an open, green, um, multi-use uh, space. Um, and we just got through with kind of, uh, it was going to be completely taken up by a, um, by a theater and they scrapped that plan. So now it's, it's up again for what to do with it. And I'm wondering your thoughts on, I've heard two kind of arguments. One, to have it completely open and, and, and um, able to be a flexible mixed use gathering space or to put a building on half of it because there's this idea that there has to be frontage on our main street in order to create um, vibrancy. So I just wondered your thoughts on that. Um, it's a really difficult question to answer because I don't live here and I don't know the, the site. I mean, just, just to be perfectly transparent, um, uh, Central Park has vibrancy. You don't necessarily need to have buildings to create that space for people. Vancouver, a lot of people have heard that Vancouver's amazing. Vancouver's amazing because it has these small parks and social gathering areas everywhere. Um, like within, within, a, within a five minute walk. So to answer that question, it's not an either or. You need to look to see what is already existing. How much open space or public use space and active public realm is available downtown? Is there a lot of it? Is there not a lot of it? 
How could this space be used as a, as a, as a flex space? Think of the National Mall in Washington, D.C. That adds, that adds a lot of vibrancy, right? So that's the first step is what, what is already existing downtown? What's lacking? What do you need more of? Because getting to a vibrant downtown is not this one thing that you need to do. It's a holistic set of solutions that need to work in tandem with one another. You need to calm the streets, you need to provide spaces for other types of mobility, such as walking, such as bikes. Having transit is great if you have the density. You need to have storefronts that are, that are transparent and active. Uh, you need to have residencies and you need to have public, public space. I mean, that's just off the top of my head and I've already left out probably 20 different things. So that's where you start the conversation of what do we have, what's missing, and what do we need to, to create a complete neighborhood. So thank you very much. Right. All right, thank you. Before you all go, I want to let you know that your attendance here allows you to have entrance to the museum. Just use your name tag, give us back the holder please, because we're a small not-for-profit. So if you return your name tags, you can keep your tag and uh, peruse the exhibits in the museum. I'd like to take this time to thank Lynn for a wonderful and formative presentation. Welcome back. We'd have to love to have you back again soon. Thank you so much.